It's great to uh, have the opportunity to speak uh, again today, uh, and it's great to see uh, uh, Bill Rebus back again. More on that in a moment. Um, no disclosures. Uh, Bill is a uh, fantastic anatomist, as, as you all know, and he would come to UVA every year uh, and teach us anatomy. Uh, and uh, it was really um, an amazing opportunity for us. Bill would come for a week uh, and give these lectures, and it's a real privilege to uh, uh, to be getting them again. It's probably my eighth or ninth time uh, seeing seeing them, but every time you learn something new. And as Dr. Jane would say, as a neurosurgeon, you really should know the anatomy of the brain. So it was always uh, kind of embarrassing when Bill would quiz you and you didn't. And uh, so there was this kind of mad panic uh, when uh, when Bill was coming. And that was prepped uh, by doing the infamous brain slices where we would have to memorize uh, an entire uh, book of these random pieces of brain. Uh, and uh, it always uh, was a stressful time for the residents. Uh, this is supposed to be interactive. Does anyone know what number 23 is? Anyone? Well, as a oh, there's a Skuian. I wonder if he still still knows. Well, as a resident, the uh, Rod, can you remember what number 23 is? So that's probably a no. So the, the chief resident would, uh, would would quiz the junior residents, and, and Nader was my uh, chief resident. Nader, do you remember what number 23 is? That's wrong, Rod. I think it was the technical area H2. Does anyone else agree? Number 23. Yeah, that's right. It's the tegmental area H2. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's why Rod did spine and uh, Nada did functional. All right, so moving on, uh, focused ultrasound. We'll go over some technology, brief history, current applications, and some future applications. Uh, Dr. Cassell talks about his Nobel Prize winning idea, this eureka moment, uh, and then had the realization that other people had come up with this uh, concept before of focusing energy uh, onto a, a focal point where there's a large deposition of energy but uh, a small amount of energy uh, going through the, the different uh, uh, rays and then getting focused down. So uh, focused ultrasound is the marriage of two innovative technologies. We use the high resolution imaging capabilities of uh, MRI and then using the uh, ultrasound to uh, do the treatment with a high deposition of, of energy at a focal point. Uh, dates back to the uh, Fry brothers. Uh, back in the 1950s, there was the uh, Fry's Monster. It was uh, two levels uh, in, in the university uh, where uh, this large kind of claw-like device would focus ultrasound beams uh, to a focal point. And so the idea has been around for a while. Uh, Dr. Vexel in the 1950s tried to uh, use focused ultrasound, uh, but the problem was uh, getting through the skull uh, and um, uh, he tried using a uh, skull defect uh, and then using the uh, the technique, but in the end settled for uh, changing his method to using ionizing radiation, which of course culminated in the development of the gamma knife in 1967 uh, with exactly the same principle that we have with uh, focused ultrasound. Uh, people didn't give up uh, in the background. People were still using ultrasound to uh, try and treat uh, brain tumors again using a, um, a craniectomy window. We couldn't get through the skull. That was the biggest issue. Uh, now, the, uh, the whole thing has come full circle because we've been able to uh, get through the skull, and I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, so focused ultrasound was kind of abandoned, sat in the corner, uh, and now the transducing technology with the ultrasound devices has improved, and at the same time the imaging capabilities uh, have improved at the same time. And it was really this uh, skull correction algorithm that was developed, uh, which uses CT scanning and the CT data, uh, or bony data from the CT scans, uh, to focus the beams uh, as they hit the skull, uh, to focus them onto a focal point deep within in the brain. Uh, and the way that works is um, there's over a thousand uh, 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 ultrasound elements in the helmet, and each one of these gets phased uh, slightly uh, so that when um, they hit the bone, they go out of phase slightly, and all of that calculation is done. So when they meet in the focal point, all of the beams are in phase. Uh, it's kind of complicated. We won't go into the mathematics of it. 
So what do you get at the focal point? You get thermal necrosis. Uh, so you can cook something for 240 uh, minutes at 43 degrees, or if you get it up to a, a high 50s temperature, uh, that will also cook it. Um, so it's either kind of a slow, long burn, which is not really practical for most neurosurgical interventions, or we try and uh, get the temperature up in the high 50s uh, for a short period of time, and that will cause uh, permanent necrosis. We get sharp margins with focused ultrasounds. It's been shown in, in the lab with animal studies that the, um, the ultrasound gets a very high drop-off, very sharp drop-off, even compared to uh, radio surgery. So there's some advantages. You can do a single treatment or you can do multiple treatments. You don't get no, dose accumulation. Uh, Real-time localization is really important, uh, so you can see exactly what your effect is. Uh, and you get 100% cell death. Uh, if, if those temperatures uh, get up in the high 50s, it's like frying an egg. Those proteins are denatured. So there's lots of different indications. These are just some of the uh, kind of ideas that people have thrown out there. There's um, uh, Carter's uh, slide of the um, early adoption and uh, there's kind of this hype phase and we're probably still a little bit in, in the hype phase with a little bit of kind of realization of what some of the limitations of the technology are. Uh, but there's lots of different things that people are interested in. So in terms of uh, current state of uh, applications uh, back in 2010 uh, was one of the uh, first studies in humans for the treatment of neuropathic pain uh, and that was done in Zurich uh, with uh, bilateral thalamotomies uh, by Dr. Martin and uh, Dr. Jean Minaud uh, with 12 patients uh, and that was uh, found to be uh, effective. And then it was really the uh, pilot trial by Dr. Elias at UVA, uh, which uh, kind of brought things into uh, prime time. Uh, and that was the uh, pilot study of focused ultrasound for uh, essential tremor. Um, all of you guys have seen people with uh, tremor. This is a very well-designed pilot study. This is a simulated eating task, uh, taking these uh, little beans and trying to, to get them into the other um, other side, and you can see how frustrating it is for the patient. Um, and then three months after thalamotomy, with the uh, with the focused ultrasound device. And thanks to Dr. Elias for uh, use of this video. Uh, and you can see the, the lesion, it changes over time. You get a little bit of edema um, on, on the T2, uh, and then that settles down uh, over time. And similarly on the flare, you can see there's a, uh, a little bit of swelling, and then uh, right up to 90 days, you don't, you don't see too much. Uh, the uh, testing during the procedure, um, the patients are tested while they're in the scanner, so prism glasses are used because as you can imagine they're lying down uh, kind of looking at their feet uh, and they're, the patients are asked to do spirals and, and uh, straight lines and uh, once we uh, know that we've got an adequate lesion, um, uh, you can see from the uh, disability testing that we know that we've uh, adequately treated the patient. And these tests are done again afterwards and they were done again uh, several months down. Uh, and this was the, uh, the results from the study in the New England Journal. And the key things to look at are uh, the disability panel uh, in the uh, uh, panel D there. Uh, you can see the, the disability panel has really gone right down and that's the one that really affects people's quality of life. So that led to the uh, randomized trial for ET. It was a sham controlled trial. Uh, so patients were shammed. They had the uh, device put on, their head was shaved, uh, and uh, basically the machine was turned on with uh, uh, one uh, watt of energy. So they, everything sounded like it was working, uh, but uh, the patient wasn't being treated. Um, and then afterwards, uh, they were uh, monitored for outcomes. And then at three months, uh, the sham was revealed revealed to the patient and they could be uh, treated. Uh, hand tremor scores uh, dramatically improved as well as the disability scores uh, and the adverse events were uh, uh, pretty minor really, no significant uh, adverse events uh, and that was published in the New England Journal. Uh, and then two year follow up uh, that's recently been published and that shows that the outcomes are durable. Uh, so you get a, a little bit of um, uh, relaxation of the of the result uh, from from three to twelve months, and then at twelve months to two years, the results were stable. 
So um, different places around the country have now got the devices here. Um, we're doing essential tremor. Uh, tremor dominant Parkinson's uh, disease was uh, also um, done with Dr. Gwen. Uh, we're looking at brain tumors for centrally located um, uh, brain metastases. Uh, and um, uh, we've treated one patient for that. Uh, and there's also another trial in Miami looking at uh, uh, tumors in pediatric and, and young adults. And I believe they've uh, treated at least one patient there. Targeted, targeted drug delivery, there's a lot of interest uh, for Alzheimer's disease and, as well as Parkinson's and that uh, has been going on in uh, Toronto, there's a safety study going there. Uh, and then there's Parkinson's dyskinesia at University of Maryland, UVA, um, and then there's some other uh, preclinical stuff that's going on. I'll talk about OCD and depression shortly. In the tremor dominant Parkinson's disease, um, this didn't really show the efficacy that um, uh, that we wanted to see. Part of that may have been patient selection, um, but uh, we'll be looking uh, sort of further at uh, whether there's an application here for tremor uh, dominant Parkinson's. Uh, with brain tumors, uh, Dr. Ram in Israel did a craniectomy and uh, treated some gliomas. Uh, Dr. Yolas uh, uh, did the same uh, thing, except it was transcranial for glioblastoma. Uh, and uh, there is a multi-center trial for uh, brain mats. Um, having said that, I think the uh, tumors that we probably will end up treating with focused ultrasound are probably the uh, more benign tumors rather than the malignant tumors. Um, meningiomas and, and so forth. The problem is um, the treatment envelope doesn't allow you to treat things that are near the surface of the skull yet. Um, but these sort of highly vascular things like gliomas and, or glioblastomas or um, renal mats, etc., that's not really going to be ideal for use with focused ultrasound. So we treated one patient with a, a, a recurrent metastatic uh, tumor. That was the targeted area of interest. This is a safety study. It's not an efficacy study. Uh, we did get some DWI changes uh, indicating that we had uh, created a lesion in the area. Um, and so there's uh, sort of further, further studies really needed to see whether this is going to be useful for metastatic uh, tumors. The treatment envelope is still pretty limited to the core structures of the brain. Potential uses. Um, we uh, got pretty excited about focus ultrasound with the um, ET stuff coming out, so we uh, kind of drank that Kool-Aid uh, of we can treat anything with focused ultrasound. Uh, and so we tried uh, pretty much everything uh, on some cadaveric specimens. Um, there's a theoretical treatment envelope there. The green line is about as far as we can get uh, with the current devices. Uh, the 220 kilohertz device um, is able to have a, a larger treatment envelope uh, because the beams uh, don't uh, uh, get attenuated as much as the 650 kilohertz system. The issue with the 220 kilohertz system is we get this uh, problem called cavitation where um, you can get uncontrolled formation of uh, air bubbles uh, and that can potentially cause a hemorrhage or something like that, and those bubbles can form anywhere within uh, the, uh, the the brain. It's not just localized to where you're sonicating. So the concern with the low-frequency system is while the treatment envelope is larger, um, you may get these uh, cavitations uh, having uh, occurring in some random place uh, that you didn't expect, particularly if there's calcifications in the brain, um, that you can get cavitation on those uh, areas. So in terms of uh, epilepsy, the failings of the Rose trial, most people are familiar with. Um, uh, uh, you guys have been talking or about to talk about laser uh, treatments. Um, but uh, Dr. Gwen and myself were interested in uh, whether we could um, do a, um, a temporal lobectomy using focused ultrasound. Uh, and we'll get to that in a moment. There's lots of potential targets. Uh, mesial temporal sclerosis, tuberous sclerosis, hypothalamic hematoma would be uh, kind of an ideal target. It's right in the, in the center of the uh, sweet spot for the uh, device. So we looked at doing some uh, hippocampal lesioning in cadavers uh, and doing this uh, sort of virtual uh, temporal uh, lobectomy uh, and then getting heat maps to see whether we could uh, in fact get the temperatures required to adequately um, uh, create a lesion in the temporal lobe. Um, and that was published in JNS and it looks like it's, it's probably feasible. It would depend very much on the patient's skull characteristics, uh, whether we could get the adequate temperatures using um, the current 650 kilohertz system. Uh, with the 220 uh, kilohertz system, uh, the treatment envelope is a lot wider and it would be easier to get those temperatures. Uh, but the issue is uh, that cavitation issue 
that I mentioned, and we haven't um, figured out a way to control that cavitation. We have cavitation detection mechanisms, so the machine will actually uh, turn itself off if it gets a uh, cavitation signal, uh, but we don't have a way of uh, uh, preventing cavitation. CSF diversion is kind of an interesting idea. People that have these uh, large cysts um, pushing on the ventricle, could we do a, um, uh, a cavitatory hole or basically just um, destroy some tissue between the, the ventricle and a cyst uh, rather than using an endoscope or something like that? Uh, so we looked at doing that with uh, septum pellucidotomy. Uh, same thing, ETV. Uh, that's a very um, sort of elegant way of doing it would be using a focused cavitation to create a small hole in the floor of the third ventricle for a uh, sort of non-invasive uh, third ventriculostomy. Uh, trigeminal neuralgia uh, is, a, uh, again, uh, another sort of interesting potential application. Uh, and we, we did this in some uh, uh, cadaveric studies. Uh, one of the issues is the petrous bone is right there, and so you get this shadow, all the energy is getting deposited to that focal point, but on the other side of the focal point you have a shadow of energy that's going to get deposited in whatever's behind it. Uh, and in this case, the petrous uh, temporal bone is there, uh, and bone is really good at absorbing ultrasound energy. One of the issues with the uh, petrous bone, as you know, is it, it has important cranial nerves in there. So, what we, uh, what we did, just like you do with um, gamma knife or, or cyber knife planning, is you can create areas of concern or you can block potential areas. So you can see from that red, uh, that red uh, circle, that is, represents um, the uh, transducer, and each one of those uh, red lines is a, is a um, transducer element that's on, and the ones that are black are ones that are off. So what the computer can do is it can figure out Okay, if you want to miss the petrous bone, I'll turn off all the elements that are shooting directly at the petrous bone. I'll turn all the other ones on and I'll give them more energy so that you get less energy deposition somewhere where you don't want, like an optic nerve or something like that. And by doing that, uh, we could really decrease the um, amount of uh, energy that was deposited uh, in that petrous bone um, to about uh, a change in temperature of about 7 degrees, which we think, um, at least as best we can tell from um, animal studies using uh, pig optic nerves and um, a few other uh, surrogates, uh, we think that the, uh, um, the facial nerve and, and acoustic nerve would tolerate that. Uh, you can do an anterior cingulotomy. We, we were able to get a, a decent temperature rise in that. Um, that hasn't really um, caught on as a uh, focused ultrasound target, although it has been used in functional neurosurgery with lesioning and RF ablation. Uh, in psychiatric disease, uh, Dr. Chang uh, uh, in uh, South Korea has been using this for OCD uh, and depression using uh, an anterior limb of internal, uh, of internal capsule uh, lesion. Um, it's a proof of concept. He's uh, done it in several patients with, uh, with good results, actually. Um, it's going to be hard to get a clinical trial in the U.S. for uh, depression and OCD, uh, but uh, hopefully one day we'll be able to head in that uh, direction. Uh, and finally, because um, uh, I've wasted my life in vascular, um, uh, I was interested in, in what would happen if you sonicated uh, blood, um, whether it be for intracerebral or interventricular hemorrhage or even ischemic stroke. There's a lot of interest for uh, using focused ultrasound to uh, bust open vessels uh, that have got clots in them. Uh, so this is the experimental setup. You can see um, if you uh, put a little um, sonication in the middle of an interventricular hemorrhage, uh, the exact size of the sonication basically gets punched out like a little marble. Um, you get a, a nice sphere that's removed. So the idea was uh, maybe someone comes in with an intracerebral hemorrhage, they get a CT scan or an MR scan, you put them in the focused ultrasound device, uh, you liquefy that blood clot, and then in the MR suite um, using um, uh, MR compatible equipment, you could uh, do a stereotactic aspiration uh, and aspirate the clot. Uh, so we took these large clots, uh, put them into our cadavers. Uh, it's um, an unusual procedure. You can't get any air into the head um, because air is the enemy of ultrasound. So we had to develop a technique to 
uh, get blood inside the head without losing any air, which uh, was tedious. Um, uh, and so you can see pre and post sonication, uh, you can liquefy uh, these pretty large blood clots. And then when you aspirate it, it's like draining a chronic subdural. It's this uh, dark, very liquid, uh, liquid blood, and it easily aspirates. And so this is a kind of pre and post uh, treatment results that you can get from a simple aspiration just done in the scanner. So in conclusion, uh, I know we're a little bit behind, so I want to move things along. It's a rapidly evolving field. Um, it's an exciting technology. The technology changes every year, and the, the, the transducers get better, the magnets get better, uh, lots of research opportunities. Uh, and uh, we're now starting to see some of these um, once where sort of experimental things um, now coming into uh, FDA approval and insurance approval and so forth. It's a slow process, but we're moving uh, in the right direction with this technology and it's uh, it's pretty exciting to have it here so with that I'll, I'll stop and take any questions